Hello everyone, I hope you're all having a fantastic day so far. Today, I wanna to give you an introduction to contracting if you haven't been in this space before. Now, for those of you who've watched my contracting video before or videos before, this will be a refresher. This will be a way for you to really sort of start to understand some of those things that you may have captured in some other videos as well. So there's not gonna be necessarily a huge presentation. I may share my screen if I wanna sort of elaborate on points a bit more. But that's about it. So let's get into it. So what is contracting? Contracting is effectively the opportunity for an individual to work for an end client and get paid outside of their payroll. What do I mean by this? So for example, let's say you are a contractor. The way you find work is either through an agency or independently. And essentially the end client, i.e. the place where you're doing the services for will give you money based on a day rate or hourly rate or whatever it may be in order for you to provide value to that place. Now, of course, when it comes to the differences between obviously contracting and employment, full-time employment or permanent employment, the difference is you're paid on payroll from that organization if you're fully employed, but as a contractor, you're off payroll. It's slightly different. And of course, this is when we get into different sort of like types of legal aspects and all that kind of stuff there, where for typical contracting within the UK, you have those that are working inside of IR35 and those who are working outside of IR35. Now, IR35 is just basically a form of tax law, employment law, or contract law, whatever you want to call it. I'm not the right person to, you know, really claim all this stuff from. So check Google, or whatever you, you need to, to really understand it. But essentially it's a way for HMRC to categorize different types of activity, okay? So if you are inside of IR35, essentially that's another way of saying that you're doing services that is very similar to a person working in a full-time job. That's effectively what it is, okay? So if you would typically do program management services for, I don't know, business commerce limited, okay? But now you're doing this as a contractor. The difference is how you're getting paid and all of that kind of stuff there. You would be deemed as inside IR35. And it's something that has gone back and forth between the end client, which is the organization that you're doing the services for, deciding and you as the individual deciding. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, you have sole responsibility of knowing what you're getting yourself into. That should not be a scary thought. It should be plain sailing or simple. For many individuals, they don't really get involved in all of that stuff, okay? They have the conversation either with the end client or with the agent who's dealing with their stuff or the accountant to determine whether they're inside or outside of IR35. And for many contractors out there, it's just kind of decided anyway and you take it for face value. But for those of you who are old school or who, you know, understand all of this stuff, you may be a bit more less, I guess, just allowing it to happen, so to speak. So that's the first thing inside. Outside of IR35 is obviously the opposite, okay? You're doing services that is not deemed as normal for somebody who is working f as full-time permanent employment within that space. That's essentially what it is. So think, it, think of it as you're doing a specific defined set of skills or projects or tasks that is unique to that end client organization, okay? So there isn't this whole thing of, you know, necessarily working to a certain cadence or rhythm or reporting to a hiring manager or whatever it may be. Of course, these things happen. That you obviously have to converse and speak to different people, but you may not be expected to work on a certain clock or cadence or rhythm, okay? It is slightly different. You may be expected to deliver against certain types of results and you, you're paid based on those results. So it's performance-based payment. So outside of IR35 is different. And of course, you're taxed differently because in the eyes of HMRC, you're seen as a business. So if you're inside of IR35, again, you're gonna be taxed the normal things that any other employee is taxed. You know, national insurance, income tax, all of those different things, as it were with a standard individual who's working for a permanent job 
or working under a permanent job. Whereas when it comes to the outside, it's different. You're going to get taxed corporation tax at 20% or wherever it is at the time you're, you're watching this video, as well as I believe income tax as well. But you need to check this with an accountant. They're the best people to go to when it comes to this stuff. Now, when it comes to the flexibility of being a contract and all that kind of stuff there, I would say that whether you're inside or outside, there is a degree of flexibility that exists. So for example, what I mean by that is when it comes to holidays and all of that kind of stuff there. Now, with many hiring managers, so a hiring manager is an individual who takes you on to work within an organization. They're usually the person liaising with the agency to ensure that things are working smoothly or whatever it may be. You typically just need to tell them that you're looking to take leave. There isn't this, oh, book your leave in ahead of time and all this stuff. No, you decide when you want to take leave. And of course, based on the culture and how you feel in terms of when you should take it or what you want to take will determine what you do. The same thing with I outside of IR35, the same sort of principle. You know, it's just etiquette and courtesy to let the team that you're working with know or the hiring manager know that this is happening. And of course, if you're providing value a certain way, you're going to be treated more like a consultant as opposed to somebody who's just come in to replace someone or just do a quick fix for the next three months or six months or whatever it may be. So hopefully that gives you an idea. And so obviously with that sense of flexibility and depending what type of contracting tax you're on, whether it's inside or outside, there is a type of flexibility and lifestyle that you can start to create. And of course you need to deliver on work and I'm not gonna make it out like you can live this coconut beach lifestyle, you know, sipping on a pina colada and all this kind of stuff there. Some do that, okay? But that isn't necessarily the common thing when it comes to contracting within the UK. Now, certain people ask, can you work remotely when it comes to contracting? And that purely comes down to the terms and conditions of the jurisdiction that are set by the end client organization. If it's in their terms and conditions and they're happy with that, then fair enough. Typically speaking, if the employee can do that, then so can you. We're living in a remote world anyway. And so it's something that is more likely going to happen for many individuals or is happening. Of course, if you're public sector or working for the government, it may be slightly different because you know, you're working under the king's sort of like legislation and stuff. And so they want to keep things as private as possible, so to speak, because they don't want any leakages or anything like that when it comes to potential information. And this is not me being a conspiracy theorist. This is me just being rational and <laughs> practical. OK, so it may be slightly different when it comes to those different things. So that's that's sort of like what is a contractor, all of that kind of stuff there and all that kind of jazz. I'm using my phone to sort of like prompt me for certain things. Now, what are certain pros and cons when it comes to contracting? Now, of course, pros are you definitely are able to make more money, you know, per task or whatever it may be. So, for example, many contractors charge a day rate and they may be paid on a weekly or monthly basis. Sometimes there is an hourly rate, but me personally, I would not recommend the hourly approach. It should be day focused at least. And the reason I say that is because you should be bill billing for a day, you know, if you're if you're doing some work. And of course, you have to fill out a timesheet that highlights what you've done during the day and stuff. And that may go up in 0 0.25 increments. But the point being made is day rate is better in terms of managing costs and everything else rather than thinking about hours and, oh, have I done this hour? Have I done that? So it's, it's long. OK, so there is that. The second sort of like pro is the fact that you have the ability to leave a space if you want to. Okay, if you don't want to work there anymore, you can hand in your notice. Typically, it's 24 hours. You can have agreements where you can set in the notice period for a week or two weeks. I've done this before when I was buying my property, et cetera, et cetera. And so there is the opportunity to do that. The third pro is your ability to network with a huge amount of people you know you're meeting so many different types of people i've worked with many different consultants working for the big five you know i'm not going to list them but you know who they are i've worked with many really smart scientists and individuals who were working towards finding solutions for the covid pandemic 
I've worked with standard individuals. I've made friends with other contractors within this space. And so there is a, a whole pool of things that you develop, okay, in terms of networking with other people. Another pro is that you start to develop this financial and entrepreneurial acumen, okay? You become more confident within a space to go on it on your own and really sort of like understand if I was managing my own business, which essentially this is depending on what tax it is, but it really is because you're, you're feeding yourself in many ways. You're building that muscle. You're building that confidence. For some people, it may be a bit nerve wracking and a bit scary that, you know, oh my gosh, I'm in the big bad world and I'm not relying on an organization to, to pay me. But really and truly, you should see it like any other role, so to speak. It's just a more un unorthodox way of doing it. Okay, so you start to develop these skills, which is a nice transition into the nine to five. The fifth thing, which is kind of linked to the last one, is you start to understand money better. You should do at least anyway. You start to understand money better, the way you manage it, what your rules are and conditions are, how you work. All of these different things come into play. And so your financial management becomes more top priority because it becomes more of a focus. OK, and I guess the the, the sick thing is that you're put in a position where you can actually accelerate a specific career path faster than you would if you were in full-time employment because you're not tied to anybody. You can keep it moving. And so I know for myself, even though I was going up a trajectory, I've been able to accelerate certain points because of my ability to work with like-minded individuals or provide value where I really wanted to provide value or get experience in a certain area that I may not have had experience in if I wasn't contracting and had that flexibility. And it really satisfies this movement towards the portfolio career that I've been banging on about for the past year or so. The idea that you don't pursue a career path, you create a career path. It's, it's, it's different, okay? Because I think it's going to be 50% of people within the UK by 2025 are going to have some sort of portfolio career. It, they're going to have some sort of portfolio career. And so with that in mind, contracting is a nice way to tee you up and prepare you for that because organizations are in a position where it's long to hire new staff because it takes three to six months to get the right staff, train them up, have all the benefits in play. It technically costs more money potentially if you're thinking about pension, benefits, conditions, all this kind of stuff, their insurances, blah, -de blah, blah, blah. Whereas with a contractor, you're paying them for their work. You don't need to worry about contributions and all that kind of stuff there. And if you're thinking about that, oh, do I get that stuff myself as a contractor? Well, you could set that stuff up yourself or go to a financial plan if you want to. Or if you are inside of IF35, a lot of these umbrella companies, these umbrella limited companies are able to give you these benefits as part of their package, okay? They give you pension package or GP24 hour services or discounts and different things, et cetera, et cetera. So there are still opportunities to have some of those things retained. What are some of the cons? Now, some of the cons are obviously you may be in a situation where you're looking for work and you may feel uncomfortable. You may be in and between work or around work or whatever the phrase is, okay? And that may feel uncomfortable. I mean, I remember when I made the decision last year to quit the contract that I was on and I had four months off. Now, the first three months I'd say was deliberate. But the last month and a half, I was looking for roles, looking for roles is around Christmas, whatever it may be. Not necessarily the best time to look for contracts, but you start to question yourself a little bit, you know, even though it's coming up to three years now, I've been in a game or whatever it may be, you do start to question yourself a little bit. So sometimes that can creep in, but you can't let it. This is why you need to sort of make sure that you develop a right brand and all that kind of stuff. Apologies if you can hear the wind, it's very windy, okay? But I'll try to sort that out. The second thing I'd say is sometimes, depending on the workplace that you're working in, you may be treated like a second-class citizen. You know, people have a misconception about contractors that they're either uptight or obnoxious or look at that person making all this money and blah, blah, blah. When people start realizing how much you make, sometimes they act funny or different and sometimes they're just normal, okay? And you want to lean into those people who act normal. 
But essentially speaking, there is a minority and it typically is the minority who act funny when it comes to this stuff. So I think that was the second or third thing. Moving on from that, another con is sometimes that, you know, when you need to sign your timesheet, there may be situations where your hiring manager, the person who brought you on from the agency, doesn't sign your timesheet in time. And so you may get delayed payment. There may be situations if you're outside of IR35 where you're waiting for invoices and all that kind of stuff to be sort of like set up, finalized, whatever it may be. And it just takes too long. And there's always this struggle to ensure that you get paid. Now, personally, I haven't had loads of those circumstances, but what I do is I don't play with my money. I make sure I set a calendar invite. I set two, okay, because I get paid weekly. I set one on one side of when the timesheet should be paid and on the other side of when it should be paid just before the deadline because obviously there's a weekly deadline that needs to be had and I add the hiring manager or the person authorized to make payment because sometimes you can have more than one person who authorizes payments on behalf of the main person to make that payment so no one is confused I, I don't play them games <laughs> okay I even set a reminder for myself to enter in the information that I need to so that payment happens that's another con as well I guess the last one is sometimes you may feel like that you can't have as many holidays or breaks, especially if you've taken advantage of that or you've just come from a long break of not working or whatever it may be. So these are things to bear in mind. OK, these are definitely things to bear in mind. So those are some of the pros and cons. Now, I've spoke about the different types of contractors in terms of inside of IR35 and outside of IR35. What I also want to add is that I have a different idea of what different types of contractors there are. So number one, you have the conservative contractor, so to speak, that does the inside or outside of IF35 stuff. That's the typical person who's doing the programs, the projects, et cetera, et cetera. You then have the freelance contractor who is somebody who is really sort of like finding their own sort of like opportunities in a way. Now, it, it may sound similar to the first one, but this freelance contractor or independent consultant, if you want to call it that, is somebody who is a strong personal brand, who has more of a consultative sort of approach to contracting and is creating their own opportunities. This could be one-to-one, one-to-many, B2B, whatever it may be, but they, they have a different stance. They're not relying on contracting agencies or certain contracting boards or whatever it may be to get their contracts. They're creating the opportunities themselves. You also have, I don't know what the specific word is for this, but let's call it the big contracts contractor. Okay, So essentially that's the person who is sourcing or procuring contracts or bidding contracts from the government. Or organizations they're going through tenders okay and this is where they can make a minimum of ten thousand pounds up to a million pounds even for delivering a certain type of service they may bring on other contracts to support them or contractors to support them on the delivery of the specific service that they've tended for okay so these are the three different types now i'm not going to talk about the that type of contractor or even necessarily the independent consultant even though it's kind of a mix I'm mainly going to be talking about the conservative contractor because I think that's the right or good level to start at if this is new to you. OK, so that's something to bear in mind. Just before I continue, if you're interested in gaining coaching from me in order to develop your strategy and raise your performance for this year, then make sure you book a call below in order for you to get that opportunity. Now, again, this is a real chance to really understand what are you focusing on this year? How are you strategically positioning yourself? How can you plan this out? And also, how can you get the effective advice, monitoring and expertise to enable that to happen? So if this is something you're interested in, whether it's contracting or not, then let me know and click on the link below. When setting up as a contractor, there's a number of different things that you need to think about. Number one, are you ready to leave your job? What are your circumstances? Do you need to quit? Are you getting severance pay? Are you getting laid off? Do you just feel you need to do it? What's your situation? Okay, you need to think about that and prepare. Understand what the leaving policy is if you're in that situation where you want to leave. Understand what the circumstances are if you're just before a potential severance pay or it's just happened or whatever it may be. 
Number two, you need to be clear about, obviously, what your bank's saying. You know, on average, it may take at least three months. I'm going to say at most three months to find a contract in any given time. But that's not a guarantee. It could take four months. It depends what niche you're in. And so you need to have an idea of what niche or industry you're looking into and what that looks like, but also what your generalist and specialist roles are. What do I mean by that? Your generalist role is essentially a role that is quite open. Okay, project manager, that's a generalist role. That can cover many different types of things, but a specialist role may be a digital transformation manager for the public health sector. That's very specialist. And there'll be times where either one of those may be useful because the project manager role can slot into any industry, whether it's business, um, it could be the environment, it could be whatever it may be. It can slot into different things. So think about what your generalist role is and your specialist role is and how it fits into a market because that will help you really brand yourself when it comes to stuff. You also want to scour the market. Okay, so look on CV Library as an example or Public Sector Resourcing or some of these other places where you can start to understand what the different roles or jobs that come up within the UK. And then you can get a sense of whether you can do those things or can't do those things. Speak to other contractors, really understand what their journey is, especially if they have a role that is similar to your generalist or specialist role. Also speak to an accountant, really, really important. Because once you've scaled the market, you looked at the day rates and all that kind of stuff there, and you've looked at your own experience because you're gonna have to have competent experience and maybe some of the qualifications that allow you to show your competence. You then wanna to go to this accountant and basically say, hey, I'm looking to make, I'm making this up 500 pounds a day because you know that's what the market offers for your type of thing on average. Maybe you can push yourself up a bit, who knows. What does this look like from an inside perspective inside of IF35 and outside perspective outside of IF35 so that you know what you'd get on a weekly basis? And of course, the outside is going to be a bit more than the inside, but you want to see what that comparison looks like. Okay, so it's important for you to break that down and speak to an accountant. Also speak to an agent. And do know that when you speak to agents, obviously they'll want you to be on their book, so they'll ask for your email and telephone number and stuff. But be kind of prepared to have a bit of a spiel. That's why you need to do all of that sort of preparation beforehand because they're going to say, what sort of things are you looking for? Okay, what, what's your experience been like? Um, have you done contracting before? And it's okay if you haven't. That's not a problem. If you haven't done contracting before, it's just something to bear in mind. And so with all of this in mind, this tees you up and gets you ready to understand what you should be applying for, all that kind of jazz there. I think that's really, really important. So we're moving on from that. We, we have an idea of how we're setting up on all that kind of stuff there. Really, really important. Now, I want to talk about the financial aspects of things. Okay, this is really a masterclass. <laughs> now, you have to look at the market and understand how much you are quote unquote worth. Now, you'll get some situations where, you know, certain organizations, I'm going to name them out right now, who just really charge really or pay really low for certain things. But you have other places that actually do really good day rates. Now, typically speaking, the government does a really good day rate and also sort of like really big corporate organizations, those within the big top five or whatever it may be, or top 10 or whatever it may be, they charge good rates. And then there are some people within the middle. So bearing that in mind, there are opportunities there. There are definitely opportunities there. Once you understand this, you then want to speak to different contractors if you have the opportunity. So go on LinkedIn, ask them questions, all of that kind of stuff there, if they're open to it, and really see what they think your day rate could be, or if they're happy, ask them what their day rate is. So you've got three different models there. So that when you do speak to you know your agent or whatever it may be, it's a situation where there is clarity in terms of what sort of day rate you're looking to get because they'll ask you, so what day rate are you looking for? And you'll say a uh, minimum of £500 a day. Simple as that. Okay, now there are certain brackets. Um, this is very sort of like negligible. There's no sweet science to this. But typically, if you are a senior leader, not manager, but senior leader, 800 plus is typically what I've seen. If you are a senior manager, 600 to 800. If you're a manager, 
maybe 400 to 600 and it may be less than that potentially and then anything else is kind of like back and forth okay now some people may say that's not been my experience as a manager i've got you know 200 or 300 again we're all different people we've all had different experiences this is just how i've seen things okay so just bear this in mind now of course when it comes to client relationships Again, when I speak about an end client, what I'm really saying is that this is an organization that you're doing services for that, again, gives the money to your agency in order for your agency to get their bit and then they pass it on to your umbrella company or limited company for you to get paid. That's pretty much how it works. And so understanding all of this stuff, you can see what the relationship looks like. So just like you would in any other organization, having a good relationship with your clients, your end client, the people that you're doing the services for is crucial because they're gonna give you testimonials, they're gonna give you feedback, they're the ones who are going to you know, give you that written statement or whatever it may be when it comes to, again, yeah, how well you've done, how you've provided value. So bear all of this in mind when it comes down to it, okay? And what I typically do is, Again, I'm a practice coach. I'm going to be using things rooted in emotional intelligence. You know, I'm going to develop my own personal self-awareness through journaling and all that kind of jazz there. I'm going to endorse self-management, okay, based on those learnings that I've made. I'm also going to be socially aware, understand behavior, because it really is managing different behaviors. And I'm also going to have social management, which is the conflict re resolution, leadership skills. It's also persuasion, all of this stuff and also have the motivating factor. So those are the five facets of emotional intelligence. All of this stuff enables you to be a really good client or have a good client-based relationship, okay? You wanna be in a situation where you confidently share your expertise or deliver on your expertise, but you also wanna be in a position where you are a great motivator and inspirer. You're somebody who asks empowering, powerful questions you're somebody who actively and deeply listens and gives people the space and psychological safety to be themselves, okay? You still wanna be a great team player, okay? Whether you're, you're independent or not. So bear this in mind when it comes to all of this stuff. Again, finding contracting opportunities is, again, really important. And a different ways you can find them is either via LinkedIn. So if you go on LinkedIn jobs, you can type in contracts or you can type in inside of IR35 or outside of IR35 and then find different things, okay? You can obviously go to standard job boards and go to the contracting section, tick it, okay? So this is why I mentioned CV library and all those different ones. You can go to specialist job boards that are specific to your industry and niche, you're gonna to have to just Google those. Maybe you wanna use Google Bard to help you find those or speak to contractors that can help you find these or maybe you got a paid version of ChatGPT that can also help you as well find different lists, okay? You've also got public sector resourcing, which is a, a, the preferred government place for contracts where a lot of these different job boards get their contracts from or do it on behalf of PSR, public sector resourcing. There's all these different opportunities. They're speaking to old colleagues okay or friends of friends who may know people or organizations that are looking for contractors these are all things that you can do to find contracts there are opportunities within this space now when it comes to legal considerations all i can say to you is that obviously understand whether you're inside or outside of if35 and you can get i believe if35 insurance just in case you get it wrong because sometimes you know, you may get someone from HMRC who likes to audit you to see whether you're in the space or not, but that rarely happens, okay? But it's good to have that just in case. You may wanna get business insurance that covers professional indemnity and um, all those different things. I think there's three main key ones, professional indemnity, and uh, I've lost it, it's off the top of my head, but look up business insurance, okay? And you'll, you'll see some of those ones. The one I use is, I believe it's called Knightsbridge which is a standard one, okay? Standard one that you use, you pay for the year and it covers you for your outside of IF35 endeavors, okay? Even if you have your own business, it covers for those things as well. And you have to bear in mind, if you've got people that who are subcontracting underneath you, you need to check whether your insurance covers those people or not to whether you have to increase your premiums when it comes to that stuff. Now, when it comes to resources and support, 
Well, really and truly, I have my own resource. So if you're looking to dive deep within contracting, I really offer two main solutions. Number one, my free YouTube videos, where you can check out the playlist of the contracting section and there's a lot of stuff on there. Actually, there's, there's quite a few bits on there. And I think I've been in a space where not many people have been able to do this. So luckily I've, I've created this space for, for individuals like yourself. But two, I have the independent consultant for people within the UK. So a guide for contractors looking to become contractors within the UK. So if you're interested in that, that is a course there's obviously a cost associated with it. If you want to learn more about that, then you can click on the link below. You can dive deep in terms of understanding all of this stuff in detail with everything highlighted, how I did it, my story, all of that kind of jazz. So there's no confusion. And there's obviously some bonus materials in there with additional interviews and all this stuff from other contractors that have experienced some of this stuff or different things to what I've experienced too. So hopefully that gives you an idea and a clue in terms of the support and resources. Of course, Google is your friend, okay? Google is definitely your friend. Also, ChatGPT and Google Bard and Claude, they're all your friends too. And I say this to say that essentially, if you're ever in a situation where you need to do more research or you need clarification on a methodology or a framework, use those different tools and resources to really help you and solidify your understanding when it comes to that stuff. Go back to different things that you've learned and try to extrapolate and framework and process your experiences before. I think it's really important that if you don't have a qualification in your desired area, you should definitely do it. I've got a qualification within MSP, Managing Successful Programs. I've also got one within Change Management as a Practitioner. Obviously, I told you I'm a trained coach and mentor via the EMCC, but also trained under ILM and ICF. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that I've probably done as well that I can't remember. But these things really help. These things really help to allow me to understand the strategic input and the operational input of how I deliver value, okay? Now, of course, I've spoken about my story before and all those different kinds of stuff there, but hopefully this has given you a really in-depth understanding of this contracting space. Now, of course, if you want to see more things centered around life management, portfolio careers, and all of those different things, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And as always, my friends, understand, reach, and expand. Peace.